Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to Highwire uh, Best Practice Webinar Series. Today's webinar is about the growing importance of video in scholarly publishing. My name is Tony Alves. I am Senior Vice President of Product Management here at Highwire. I'll be introducing today's topic. Uh, I'll be introducing our presenters, as well as moderating questions and discussions. So uh, for some housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, that recording, uh, it will be shared after the meeting. Uh, it will be freely accessible, so feel free to share it once uh, it's available. Please uh, put your questions in the question box uh, as you think of them, and we'll answer those questions uh, during the Q&A after all the presentations are over. And finally, uh, today's webinar, it's brought to you by Highwire's hosting solution, Scolaris. Our new generation hosting solution designed to support video and other media in the service of scholarship. So there's my, there's my advertisement. I hope I sounded a little bit like NPR. So in the 1990s, uh, I joined a startup called Silver Platter Education. Uh, and there we, we produced and published educational content uh, for physicians on CD-ROM. Uh, we worked closely with a division of the American Medical Association called American Medical Television. And they provided us the, uh, with continuing uh, medical education accreditation, as well as access to their video content. So the idea was to convert their analog content uh, to digital and to integrate useful video clips into what was then called multimedia programming. Uh, the problem was that most of the video uh, really was, was just people talking, which was not particularly compelling. Uh, and uh, video uh, we found was, of course, much more useful when it showed procedures like surgical techniques or diagnostics like ultrasound. Uh, so we shifted the editorial focus uh, away from that American medical television type content to more visual disciplines. Um, but of course, the problem with video uh, on CD-ROM, which it's fine for its purpose, but you know it's not discoverable, it's not reusable, um, it just sits there on the CD-ROM in isolation. Um, and there was another problem with video back then. Uh, when we brought that content to the internet a few years later, it was really hugely disappointing because bandwidth in the late 90s and the early 2000s made video and audio uh, undependable as a medium. Uh, not everyone had the equipment or modem speed. Today, of course, video and audio content on the internet is omnipresent. YouTube and TikTok, they dominate the industry. Uh, even scientists are producing TikTok videos. Uh, platforms like Zoom are essential for communication and collaboration. Um, and there are new specialized platforms that provide full service online uh, conference functionality, uh, and those have multiplied. Uh, this really has created new opportunities for commercialization and distribution of this live content. Uh, and now with, you know, with so few technical restrictions, video um, are being used in scholarly content to a much greater extent and for a wider range of purposes. So researchers and publishers find that uh, video can help explain concepts better than text. It increases the impact of the learning experience. Uh, it's more... And, Frankly, it can be more entertaining. Uh, so uh, video, uh, you know, it's now a, can be considered a first class research object. So it's used in peer review journals like Jove, um, in online textbooks, in e-learning products. So it, what this means is that uh, like other scholarly content, video content requires agreed metadata standards to enable machine readability. It needs indexing for categorization and repositories and indexing for discoverability. Uh, on the internet, uh, and it needs taxonomies and ontologies applied so that tools that use artificial intelligence or machine learning can have a semantic understanding of the material. So in this best practice webinar, the speakers will address uh, some of the themes in various ways. Uh, our first speaker, Dylan uh, Riediger, uh, Senior Analyst at Ithaca SNR, uh, he will kick us off 
uh, with video as a form of scholarly communication. Uh, Dylan will be followed by Bill Kasdorf, uh, uh, Principal at uh, Kasdorf and Associates, uh, also founding partner of Publishing Technology Partners, and also uh, particularly important for this presentation, co-chair of the NISO Video and Audio Metadata Working Group. Uh, Bill will present NISO's uh, Video and Audio Metadata Recommended Practice, a Rosetta Stone for Interchange. Um, Marjorie Lava, uh, President of Access Innovations. Uh, she'll go third uh, with Where the Rubber Hits the Road, uh, a case study or case studies uh, for uh, metadata enrichment. And finally, uh, Highwire's Hosting Solutions Product Director, Oliver Ricard. Uh, he will bring you uh, some uh, results from a survey uh, that he did with our key customers. We'll be looking at things like how and why do publishers incorporate video into their content? What challenges do they face? What are their aims? And, and, and what are they looking for in the future? So with that, I am going to now turn it over to Dylan. Um, I will stop my sharing. And Dylan, I don't know if you're talking yet because you're we don't hear you, but yeah, sorry about that. Um, thanks, Tony, for inviting me to uh, speak today. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really looking forward to learning from Bill and Ollie and Marjorie as well. Um, as Tony alluded to, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the kind of context for today's discussion, um, at least as I see it, um, by talking about the current state of scholarly video within the larger landscape of scholarly communications and publication. And I should be clear um, right off the bat that when I'm talking about scholarly video today, um, for my purposes, I'm mostly referring to recordings or live streams of research presentations. The actual category of scholarly video, as Tony has already mentioned, is much more diverse than that. Um, but I will be talking primarily about uh, conference presentations, webinars such as this, as ex instances of video as a type of scholarly communication. And my comments today are informed by two projects that uh, my organization, Ithaca SNR, has been engaged with over the past year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ithaca SNR is a not-for-profit research organization that works on and studies information practices and information technology in higher ed and scholarly communication. And we've been spending 2022 working on two projects that relate to my comments today. The first is a project on streaming media as viewed from university libraries. Um, this is a project that we've run in collaboration with 24 institutions in the United States, Canada, and Germany. Uh, and it has focused on two different questions. The first, which was published this spring, was a national survey of libraries about how they make decisions about what kind of content to license, how they feel about the features of those various services, what they would like to see, um, and why they make the decisions they do about what they, what they purchase. And uh, most significantly, libraries really think at this point of video as a medium that is mostly useful for instructional purposes and think about it primarily as a category uh, that, that goes into their thinking around supporting teaching and learning rather than research. The second project that kind of informs my remarks today is a, a year-long project that we've been doing with funding from the Sloan Foundation on the future of scholarly meetings. This project is also a cohort-based project. It involves 17 scholarly societies of very different sizes and levels of resources who have spent the year working together through a series of workshops and design-informed uh, activities to chart a future for scholarly meetings in light of their experience over the last couple of years. I wanted to start by, by asking the question of why we're talking about video now today. Um, and I think that the short answer to that is because of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic 
led to a you know moment in time where virtual and hybrid conferences went from being anomalous and marginal types of scholarly activities to literally being the main form of scholarly communication uh, it, that that at least of the type that used to be presented in person and orally. Um, and one of the byproducts of this was the sudden emergence at a very large scale of a large amount of recorded content as people took advantage of the ease with which you can record uh, things on Zoom like we're doing today. And it really helped to kind of bring form bring to the forefront uh, several important questions about what conferences, what purpose conferences served within the scholarly communication landscape, how their intersection with video and being recorded might change their purpose in that landscape or um, shape their future, and also um, how this kind of content might either be monetized or otherwise leveraged to become a more visible part of the scholarly communication landscape. Uh, In-person presentations typically disappear. They're a very ephemeral form of scholarly communication. We suddenly have them uh, potentially preserved for posterity. What does that mean? What kind of infrastructure and financial models would support making those widely available? Our, my intersection with this is, comes partially from thinking about researchers, but also since we've been working with scholarly societies, um, really uh, imagining what this uh, means to them. And I think for scholarly societies, um, this is a really interesting topic. They are the people who organize a very large share of academic conferences, and thus they um, own or acquire very large numbers of recorded content these days. Um, and they are also organizations that, generally speaking, have been experiencing declines or in membership, um, have seen the changing economics of higher education mean that their meetings are often a lot smaller than they used to be, um, and also have been involved in changes in the publication landscape that have meant that their relationship to journal revenue is changing as well. And inside of that general context, the uh, sudden plethora of videos that they had really presented some options about what to do with it. Um, in very broad strokes, that could be a kind of mission-oriented uh, direction in which video is used to spread uh, knowledge that is being produced by society members. It can look like direct sale to individuals. This is often the case, particularly with like continuing education um, when societies are involved with that. Or they could be aggregated and then licensed to a third party venue. At the same time, societies are trying to figure out how to position themselves in this um, new world of, of abundant video. Um, a number of startups have kind of emerged um, or been uh, very active in the last few years in trying to figure out commercial models for this kind of content. Very broadly speaking, you can kind of see three categories of, of activity here um, in the startup space in particular. And obviously, these categories, uh, they're neat little buckets here, but they merge in real life in interesting ways. Um, and I'm drawing here on an article that uh, my colleague Daniel Cooper and I wrote earlier this year in the Scholarly Kitchen. Um, we're seeing startups that are really focused on consulting and advising societies about revenue generating strategies from their meetings and from the content that comes with them, and who are working to develop strategies to produce and add value to the video that make them more discoverable and dynamic. And I think uh, Cadmore is a really good example of people working in this general space. Um, sometimes this comes with a proprietary platform. Other times the services are, are agnostic as to platforms. A second model is aggregating content from a bunch of societies and many conferences and turning it into kind of a Netflix-like offering that presumably university libraries or other large institutions uh, would purchase licenses for. Underline IO is a good example of this kind of general approach. And then there's uh, another group of organizations that are really thinking about connecting workflows and outputs. Um, and 
very thorough integrations of this kind of content into a larger landscape of scholarly communication and publication. Um, one good example of that might be Cassini with their recent partnerships with Elsevier and Springer Nature to think about bringing conferences into journal portfolios. There's a lot of challenges to seeing how successful these are gonna be, however, um, and a lot of unanswered questions that are still out there. Um, the first is that the value of this content really has not been firmly established. Um, this is partially a question of a, a lack of clarity about the role conference presentations play in like the iteration of ideas over time. Um, it's partially a question about how the value of those materials survives the transition from live to, to recorded events. Um, but it's also because of this kind of interesting disjunction. Um, Ithaca Snart has a faculty survey every three years. And one of the things that we pretty consistently find is that scholars consider conferences to be the single most important tool they have for keeping up with new research in their field, which suggests that conference material is really valuable and that circulating it more widely might be really helpful. However, we also know from our, our streaming survey that libraries really think of this content as instructional, not research oriented. And so there's a disjunction there between uh, the value that researchers put on this type of material and the way that libraries think about it that affects um, certainly libraries' willingness to pay for these kind of resources. And there's a, there are a whole host of kind of places where the value of this material um, isn't really clear. Are, are conferences um, useful, but does the, the value of the presentation decline very quickly as it's superseded by other kind of outputs, for example? A, a second challenge uh, is that the supply may have already peaked. Um, Virtual conferences and hybrid conferences, I think, are going to be part of the landscape going forward. Uh, that seems pretty clear, but we're already seeing that a lot of societies are returning to being primarily in person with their annual meetings, um, and that the abundance of the last few years may start to drop off um, relatively quickly. And finally, there are questions about discoverability, and, and Tony has already uh, alluded to this. I think uh, it's a good segue into Bill and Marjorie's comments, certainly. Um, video as it exists right now, this is true of conferences and much other content that's used by faculty um, in teaching and research contexts is very decentralized. It's hosted on many, many, many platforms. Um, it's very hard to, to locate, and the kinds of conventions around metadata and other kinds of systems that are well established for journals and books to help increase discoverability are, are still very much emerging right now. Um, also, there's this question about how people use video, which makes internal discoverability really important. You don't necessarily want to watch the whole hour long presentation today. You just want to see what Bill had to say. Well, how do you get to that point in the video? Um, so there are questions about not only metadata for the whole object, but how you break the object into smaller pieces. Um, I'm going to leave it there and um, turn things over to uh, the next person in line. But I'll say thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, that was that was a great way to set the set the table um, for uh, some of the other conversation. I, I also just want to remind everybody to please uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the uh, question and answer box, uh, the, the Q and A box, and we will address those as we get uh, at the end of the at the end of the webinar. Uh, okay, so. Bill, I think I'm turning it over to you. All righty, thanks very much. Make sure that uh, you're seeing my screen and that it's full screen. How's that? Yes. So this was a, a really interesting uh, project. Actually, I have to uh, remind myself not to use the past tense in this presentation because we're actually not quite done yet. 
but um, oops, uh, we're very close to uh, the completion of the project. We're we finished the uh, public comment period. NISO has a very uh, structured process for developing both standards and recommended practices. Um, and um, we are now uh, in the middle of evaluating the comments that we've gotten during that uh, public comment period. And uh, the, the standard will be, or the recommended practice will be published uh, shortly, I would guess but by the end of the year. But if uh, Nettie is on, she might want to correct me on that because I always have overly optimistic expectations for things like that. Um, so what, what prompted this in the first place? Well, the key is that there are already a lot of metadata schemes that enable communication about metadata about uh, video and audio media assets. Um, but the trouble is that often two parties use different ones. And what we're mainly concerned with here is interchange of media assets, video and audio assets. Um, and by interchange, there's really two dimensions to that. One is discovery and the other is delivery. So part of it is I'm looking for this asset. Uh, how do I find the right one? And the other is I'm, give, I'm providing this asset from party A to party B. What does party B need to know about what party A is sending, et cetera? Oops, sorry. And the, the problem is that those two parties, more often than not, in fact, most often, in effect, speak different languages, different metadata models, different metadata languages. So a librarian, for example, lives and breathes MARC records, right? Um, but a broadcaster probably knows nothing about MARC records and wouldn't be able to decipher one, but they speak PB Core, which is a metadata model for uh, the broadcast industry. Another example is a journalist might speak um, what's called IPTC Video Metadata Hub. The IPTC is the International Press Telecommunications Council. It's the uh, standards body for the global news media. And um, they've done a, a, a great job of uh, developing a really kind of a master model that integrates and, and uh, relates to a lot of the various models used, particularly in that side of the world, um, which is why it's called the metadata hub. But uh, most likely a web de developer doesn't know that, doesn't know how to use it, et cetera. When they're putting metadata in a website, they're using schema.org. And here's another example that's the most common of all, which is a researcher, for example, that actually doesn't use any particular metadata model, uh, et cetera and an aggregator of the content that that researcher may be producing as a proprietary model, isn't using any of the publicly available quote standard models. So um, what we need is a, a Rosetta Stone basically to enable interchange between parties who don't speak the same language. Uh, and so that's what we set out to do. And I wanna be very clear about how we did this, what we did, what we didn't do, uh, and why that's why we why we did it the way we did it. So we started by really putting together a fantastic group of people. It was a really broadly representative of the industry and a whole bunch of really smart people. I was really pleased to be working with these folks. Uh, Tony was one of them, by the way, our host this morning. Um, so we had publishers, we had librarians, we had metadata standards experts, we had platform vendors, we had service providers. Um, Try, tried to get um, a lot of input uh, from different stakeholders in this space. Uh, it was chaired by Violin Iglesias of Cadmore Media, Barbara Chen, who had recently retired from the MLA, and Michelle Erberg, who's an expert in scholarly metadata. She did a lot of the heavy lifting in this project, and me. So four co-chairs, I think that's kind of a lot, but that's how it worked out. And I have to give a shout out to Nettie Lacasse of uh, NISO, uh, who just did a really terrific job of keeping us on track and guiding us through the NISO process, et cetera. So first thing to, be, to, to emphasize is that it's a recommended practice, not a standard. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is that there are already lots of standards that are relevant to media, as I mentioned before, 
And people use those standards in many different ways. And often they use proprietary models and whatever model they're using, whether it's a standard or a subset of a standard or a proprietary model, um, it typically is so deeply embedded in content and systems in their organization that they're just really extremely unlikely to change the, the way they're using that metadata. So th they speak that language and they're not gonna throw it away and speak some new language. Also, it's really important to stress that it's a vocabulary, not a taxonomy. We weren't trying to create, as I mentioned, a new standard, and that in includes not being a really formal uh, taxonomy. Uh, the idea was it's a vo vocabulary using plain English terminology that pretty much anybody could understand. The idea is that party A using model A, say Mark, and party B using model B, like PB Core, for example, won't understand each other's uh, metadata, but they can both understand this vocabulary because it's just clear clear to understand. So basically, what we're do we're, what we're doing with this is saying these are the things you need to tell a sender uh, that a sender needs to tell a recipient in a in a in an exchange of uh, of media assets, discovery or delivery. Um, we're not saying, we're saying that if you use these terms, party A will understand what that means in their language and party B will understand what it means in their language, but they won't understand each other's. It is structured, so it's hierarchical. There are three levels and it also includes synonyms and examples. And if we've got time, I'll, I'll give you a look at it at the end. Um, and the, uh, the properties uh, are grouped into five categories. First, there's some header metadata, then a lot of bibliographic metadata. And we actually use three different terms for that because uh, by, by bibliographic, we also meant, you know, what would you use for citation? What do you use for identification? It's all that cluster of information about, uh, about an asset. And then technical metadata, semantic metadata and administrative metadata. So five different categories of, uh, of metadata in the, in the scheme. One other thing that comes up all the time is, well, aren't we doing crosswalk between various metadata models? Not at all. We are not doing crosswalks, partly because um, even though, yes, we did study uh, a number of existing standards, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, users that use those standards don't use them all in the same way. So basically a crosswalk in that context is really just useful between user A and user B. Um, so it does enable crosswalks between users, but it seemed impractical, if not impossible for us to provide crosswalks. So it's just a, uh, a vocabulary that can help bridge between uh, models. And then, as I just mentioned, we used, uh, we studied eight commonly used metadata models. Not that we were trying to develop crosswalks between them, but basically we, we, we had an expert in each of these eight models basically dive into our properties once we had the, the properties de developed in a, in a close to finished form and basically said, can you express what we're looking for here in your model? And is there anything that you express in your model that we haven't thought of properly? So that we're just kind of road testing our, our properties. And so those eight models were Mark Records, MODS, PB Core, which is broadcasting, EBU Core, which is the equivalent in the, in the EU. I already mentioned the IPTC Video Metadata Hub, Dublin Core Metadata, Common Metadata, which is the basis for the IDER DOI for uh, entertainment, uh, media, assets, et cetera, and schema.org that's uh, universal in, in the web world. Um, and another thing we did, which was really an important aspect of this is developed a real boatload of use cases where uh, we basically said, okay, let's, let's, you know, we had a big working group of very uh, rep people representing lots of different points of view Give us examples of I'm party A and I'm looking to discover a video 
uh, for this purpose, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what do I need to know? What information do I need? Uh, we're not talking about what terms necessarily, but we're saying what information do I need uh, to be able to discover something, to be able to uh, send something to a recipient. And one thing that became clear, particularly in, in uh, regard to that last aspect of interchange, which is sending the content, is that we didn't include things that would be part of, uh, of the relationship between the sender and the recipient once the, uh, once the relationship was established. So for example, um, specific terms of use, et cetera, um, oftentimes that's contractual. Oftentimes that's uh, a matter of, of negotiation, et cetera. So um, our, our, our interest was just making sure that the right sender and the right recipient could connect properly about the right asset. And then obviously there'll be more uh, information that they'll exchange in their, uh, in their, in their, uh, as their relationship goes forward. And then after we had, it was 40 some use cases, a lot of use cases, um, we did a, uh, an analysis of those use cases. And I'm using the term we somewhat loosely because it was mainly Michelle Erberg who did the heavy lifting on this. So Michelle did a, did a fantastic job of really analyzing all these use cases and trying to surface the commonalities between them. So one thing that we found was that um, there were 15 metadata properties in our uh, vocabulary that were basically global. In other words, virtually all the use cases, uh, that they were relevant to virtually all the use cases. Um, and so we put those in a, in a, in a first category uh, of global properties. And obviously not all of them will be appropriate to each any transaction, but they're all uh, should be thought about. But then we also realized that um, there were six different domains that actually had different kinds of needs. There were certain kinds of metadata that, you know, while they almost always used some or all of those 15 global properties, they also had specific things, uh, properties that were specific to, the, to, to their uh, world. And those six different domains were education, events, journalism, libraries and archives, publishing, and research. Um, pretty, pretty interesting group of six different, uh, different categories. So here are the global properties. I'm not going to read this list to you. Uh, and I apologize. I really don't like putting that many words on a slide. But I thought for the record, you're going to want to know what are those 15 global properties. Um, and if you glance through that, you'll see that they're pretty universal with any exchange of a, of a video asset and a, uh, or an audio asset. But then, for example, in education, who, who's the content provider, or the publisher of this content was important. Interestingly, that wasn't necessarily important in the other domains or in all of the other domains, or it would be on the global list. Who's the contributor, the author, basically? Are there citations to this thing? Has this thing been peer reviewed? Uh, are there translations of this thing? What about related assets? Is there a transcript, which for uh, accessibility purposes is, is very useful. We've got a lot of accessibility properties, including things like closed captions, et cetera. So anyway, uh, as an example, the education domain really wants those six in addition to whichever the global properties are also uh, relevant to that the particular transaction. Whereas events, um, very different profile. What type of event, event is this? Is there an identifier for this event? Who's the sponsor or sponsors of this event? When was this, did this event occur? Have there been citations to it? And uh, is there a publication resulting from this, from this event? So um, that, that's an overview. I think I have exhausted my 15 minutes. But let me just uh, stop sharing here a second, because I think I should. Um, I think I should at least give you a look at what does this vocabulary look like. So basically, I'm just going to scroll through here. Don't try to read this as I go by. 
but it's structured into here's bibliographic metadata. It's got an identifier, it's a title, and then we've got types of titles. We've got contributor, types of contributors, role, title, affiliation, et cetera. Um, version, editions, part information, language, asset, episodes, series, events, and then technical metadata, all kinds of technical metadata. So you see, I wanted you to see this because the actual list of properties is huge. Um, and again, it, it uses pretty much universally understood uh, terminology, semantic metadata, administrative metadata. Um, there we go. So I will stop sharing and hand it back to Tony. I'm happy to take questions later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we did uh, get a point of clarification from uh, Jill O'Neill from NISO that uh, the recommended practice uh, document should be out before the close of 2022. Um, Excellent. And she also confirmed that Nettie is a fantastic colleague. And I would have to, <laughs> I've she, been working with Nettie on a couple of other projects as well. And it's amazing how well she keeps NISO uh, projects moving. It's I can't great. imagine all the balls she has in the air. And it's a bunch of hurting. It's hurting multiple herds of cats is what yeah. she's, her job is. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's great working with her. So. Good. So yes, please, uh, if you have any questions about uh, anything Bill covered, please put those in the Q&A. We'll get to those eventually. And now, uh, Margie Lava, I will uh, take the reins. Okay, so. Excellent. <clears throat> Looking okay? It looks good. Okay, so I'm Margie Lava from Access Innovations. And it's a fairly venerable company at this point, but I don't need to dwell on this slide except for the semantic services, I think is an important part of this presentation, which is where the rubber hits the road. I wanna talk about some case studies for video metadata enrichment, um, doing it automatically as possible, um, but it's a, um, a constant challenge for all of us. Let's figure out which thing. So, you know, the, the real question is, where do you find information? <laughs> I guess my slides are wonky. There. Um, what it might be called, which is gonna vary a lot, where to look, how it looks, and particularly when there is no text to query openly, um, it takes some time to figure out where you're, where you're looking. You used to be able to wander the stacks, browse the stacks and figure out um, what's there. And something like the Long Library in Trinity has an interesting classification system on the, on the pillars and not so hard to find, but other libraries like this Admont library have uh, decided to change all the spines to uh, say nothing. And so then you have no idea what's in them. I guess it reduces theft or something. Um, but if there's sparse library, sparse made it metadata like on a library card, there's not much access. Here's a typical library card and it has two things for the tracings for subject headings and one is uh, useful and then it's anatomy common pathological and the other is title which is not at all useful for searching. But video is notorious for no metadata at all. There might be a title or a newspaper slug and you might have the length Oh, I don't know it's a really long video is not particularly helpful search technique. Um, it's kind of like trying to look at microfilm to find an answer. You just you just can't can't do it. It's it's terribly trying. I did want to mention one little side point, and that is that from the National Information Center for Educational Media, which was founded in 1964 at the University of California, was a division of Access Innovations from 1986 to 2016. And so we got pretty immersed in media types, including 
60 millimeter films and videotapes and film strips and slide steps and models and things that people would um, use in the classroom for education. It was an interesting market because there were over 35,000 items in print at any given time from about 84,000 producers and distributors. So not many items per producer and distributor. So there was a need for a central resource to tell you where what that metadata was, the series, um, and then make them available to state libraries, usually for the visually impaired, um, and schools and other educational facilities that wanted to buy these materials for use in the classroom. It also became a cataloging resource and an online database. It was on dialogue and on silver platter, as a matter of fact. But today, everybody has video. It's no longer a um, narrow market but how we file it, how we find it, the guidelines and so on are something that um, the project that Bill just mentioned has, has made my major strides for. We all have video from conferences, slides, you know, you see everybody clicking their camera at the uh, uh, slides at a conference. So you have those kinds of things. You also have uh, tutorials and lab experiences and and pictures of grandkids. Um, so the meta, the NISO recommended practice is going to be very helpful. And of course, it's got all kinds of metadata information. But the one I particularly wanted to talk about is semantic metadata, because that's the one that gives you access to the content itself. So in order to add semantic metadata to video, you need to have a text layer. You can't just um, index the words, you have to transcribe those words um, into text so that they can be subject tagged. Um, people who say they tag the, direct, the videos directly are in fact transcribing the videos and then subject tagging, tagging them. And it is a lot better, it's more controlled with a controlled vocabulary. And you can either do it as a whole piece, like books with library cards, you're indexing the entire item, but um, if you wanted to get to the part of this webinar where um, Bill is speaking about the um, Rosetta Stone, then you need to go by uh, timestamp and into the full text of the video and tag it in line at each little snippet so that you can find that particular place on the video where something is mentioned. Then you want to save it to a repository so it can be searched and add the semantics to the search system so that those words can be searched as well. So here we go. We have an audio transcription here with a date stamp. Um, we're running it through automatic indexing and then parking it in a, a repository that is searchable in the top here. Um, this is not a need just for publishers. Actually, our best use cases have been with large for-profit organizations like a large chemical company where they uh, request an ID number and then they submit some initial metadata. And then that video is ingested and we run the transcript with the timestamps um, call on miscellaneous sources to index the data, not just conceptual vocabularies, but also types of drugs, for example, chemicals used, um, maybe a geographic location or a affiliation of where within the massive number of laboratories within this company was this thing produced. So we want to get a really good idea of where where to get the information, but also where to find your colleagues so that you can discuss it, uh, maybe improve on the process and so on. Same would be true for conference proceedings and other kinds of videos. Um, once the record has been reviewed, even the transcript if they want to, although I have yet to find somebody who wants to review a video transcript with uh, date stamps other than in a test mode, um, the search system adds the metadata to the search, and when that search is implemented, we want to make sure that the subject metadata is a priority over all the other parts of the index. So it's not just a full text index. This is an example of the tagging sequence. 
where we have a submission form and more information and then the actual tagging of the records. You can see this is tagged with uh, several sources. Then in line in the video, and I'll show you an enlargement of that in a minute, um, so that we know what they said, the, the message itself, the suggested terms, and the timestamp. And we load that into the repository for search. This is what the uh, actual records look like. You can get these in a number of formats. This one is a JSON format. Um, it's called pretty JSON as opposed to the packed or version. So the stuff is spread out a little bit. You can actually look at it. Um, so here, here we have the message. It's the timestamp start and end of this particular stamp um, and where what they said and then the things that are tagged to it. And you can do this in different um, sizes, different message slug sizes. It's up to the consumer how they most want to do that. And then at the bottom, all these extra stuff, um, you can see additional terms applied to different information. So another um, organization with a lot of content is, um, and this one I can name, McGraw-Hill Engineering, and they have a great many textbooks um, online at Highwire, as it turns out, um, and that information is uh, tagged automatically with multiple taxonomies. And there the terms are weighted so that we have an idea of what's the most important term within this um, section. And the, the enriched content, whether it's the XML, a video transcript or an Excel spreadsheet or something, caption or something else is indexed using a, a controlled vocabulary or a series of controlled vocabularies in this case. And we can look at them in a, in a number of different ways, including um, thinking of them as an AI training set, if you want, or classifying or metadata enrichment. So in this workflow, you see the original materials. They are passed through a bunch of content analysis and term identification, run against the controlled vocabularies, um, using automated tagging, and then those items are applied to each unit of content and load it onto the uh, host site. So there are some challenges with this kind of stuff. Um, is the timestamp really the right thing to do? Should you say I want to index something every 200 or 500 or some number like that characters? Um, when you do the transcriptions, um, do you know if there's a section or paragraph? Um, you can identify some of that by when the um, presenter says, next slide, please, um, or something along those lines, or there's a pause while things are moving. Um, and then you could identify by um, section or by paragraph. That's a little more challenging, and so it's not as broadly done. And then every now and then there's awful noises in the background, and um, they adversely affect the ability to do a transcription. It's like having a big splash of black ink from the printer onto the um, text that you were trying to print. You, just, you can't read what's behind it and you can't hear it. Um, another, so it makes for a bad, um, bad transcription and bad indexing. Getting the APIs connected so that you have all this information in the right place from the incoming um, audiovisual material to the um, exported um, terms um, for the record and making sure that the search system is able to search to the timestamps as well um, is sometimes challenging. And then ensuring that the search uses the metadata as a priority time, term and not just dumped into the full text. If you just dump the search terms into the full text, you'll get a five to 7% increase in accuracy in your search, which is hardly worth doing. Um, it's nothing to sneeze at, but if you use it as priority term search, you get a 40 to 60% increase in accuracy of the search. 
Um, and that is considerable and enough to make it sure that in that inverted index, you search the controlled vocabulary first and then the full text. There are challenges with the metadata. Um, we, we want to be able to balance the access to the data using metadata, and you can have as many types of metadata as you want. We tend to favor keeping them separate. Um, so you can have geographic or concept, conceptual. Um, you can have authority files for drug names and chemical names um, or gene names. There is an average of 19 synonyms per gene name and then human genomes. So you want to be sure that you get the right one applied to the text. It's annoying, sorry. Um, and there are also uh, people in affiliation data organization names that you want to get added in so that you know who to contact and build communities of practice. And then you can use a lot of the coding um, files. These are primarily ICD-10, CPT, and HCPCS are primarily medical coding, uh, but the UNSPSC is coding for retail, for example. Um, and whether you want to aggregate the terms for a full record, so the full video gets a batch of terms, um, which then you could further wait to show you how many are, what terms are the most important terms, um, or if you want to search the timestamp. Um, and when they are weighted for the full object, um, is that the only metadata that you want to give for the v for the audiovisual piece. It's a matter of balance, and uh, we have guidelines for those, but they are decisions that need to be made. So um, there are new guidelines out from NISO, as you heard from Bill, and so you're not alone in trying to figure out what, how to work with audiovisual materials. Um, I showed you the workflow for two large companies. They're integrating metadata specifically for videos. And then we reviewed for a minute the challenges in implementation um, and the decisions to be made. So that's it for me. Back to you, Tony. Thank you. I was having trouble uh, clicking mute as my screen jumped around. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I, uh, I think what you have seen so far is um, sort of us starting out at um, a 20,000 foot level uh, and uh, thinking it from uh, thinking about video from um, and how video is used from a very broad level and, and somewhat technical. And now we're moving into some more uh, practical um, uh, information uh, in terms of how is, how is it being used? Why do publishers use it? Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Ollie, Oliver Ricard, uh, and he will uh, take it from here. Thank you, Tony. Um, yes, I'm gonna be going through a, a survey that I did with a few of, of our customers at Highwire to find out what publishers are actually doing at the moment and, and what they wanna do in the future as well. So these are some of the questions that I was asking them. So. Why are our publishers incorporating video into their content at all? How are they doing it? What are their challenges? Um, and then what are their hopes and dreams for, for the future of the video? These are the three publishers that, that I talked to. So we've got RCGP, the Royal College of General Practitioners, Springer Publishing and McGraw-Hill. And as you'll see here from McGraw-Hill, we've got a couple of different sites, one of which in fact, uh, Margie just mentioned, and I'll be carrying on that story a little bit for, for that site. But they've got another one that operates in a slightly different way. Um, and then for Springer, we've got a site that's got lots of journals and, and lots of books on a single site. And then for RCGP, we've got a site there that's that's a single journal on one site. So already we've got, we've already got publishers doing different things and operating in different ways. So let's dive into the first one of those, RCGP. Um, what do they do with the video? What, what are these guys doing is they conduct author interviews every week. So they'll, they'll do one, one a week, they'll, they'll take a recording of about 15 minutes. And then from that recording, they will create a 10 minute podcast and put that onto Spotify. And they'll create a 90 second video approximately and put that onto YouTube. 
So they're using generic services for audio and for video. There's nothing specific about this at all. They're using what everyone, what everyone else could use. And why are they doing that? The, the key thing here for these guys is they really want to embed that video in loads and loads of different places. They're not just putting it into their books or journal, their kind of key core publication material. They're embedding, embedding it far and wide. So they want to put the video on Twitter. They want to put it on Facebook, onto their journal website. So um, that's a, a high wire hosted site, classic journal site that, uh, that is part of the mission, but also in their blog and monthly newsletters and press releases. So it's everywhere. So, so having things in YouTube and then, and then in, in, as a single source and then be able to put that in lots of different places is really important for them. Let's have a quicker look at how that works. So here is just one of those places that they've put the video and, and embedded it in. And if we scroll down, you'll see that right at the top, yeah, uh, front and center, for these guys, video is, is a really key thing. You can see it's the first thing they put on screen. Here is that, that YouTube embedded uh, video and then underneath it, the, the embedded Spotify podcast. And of course, you've got all the standard features of, of YouTube available here. I thought this was an exciting piece of work because it is uh, the first of its kind. Etc. Um, and of course, I can also go watch that on YouTube as well or, or, or watch, listen to the um, audio on Spotify. So those options are all there for us. we we'll come back to, back to the slides. So why YouTube? Easy to multipurpose across lots of platforms, as we've just seen. Uh, it's still easy to upload into the journal homepage, but it uses a, a feature called snippets to just drop in the bit of code that, that YouTube gives you to do the embedding. And they've got access to all the features of YouTube. So there's really good analytics that they're using, users can play with the viewing speed, <clears throat> turn captions on or off and play with it. And then there's privacy settings, so, so videos can be controlled who, who gets to see them. There's scheduling, so they can control when, when the video gets published from YouTube, there's playlists. A key thing here at the end is, is it also means that RCTP videos are available within the up next feature of YouTube. So, so users who are generally using YouTube will get RCTP content flowing into that if YouTube deems them uh, appropriate users. Uh, why is this particular publish using video at all? Key thing here is widening the, risk, the reach of research. They want more users to have, to have sight on the research that, that, that's being put out there. But also beyond that, there's a kind of, there's a depth thing. There's a kind of, as well as the research, um, we want the users to have a sense of who is doing the research and that, that increases that, the, the depth and richness of, of the content. And then on the other side of things, having these videos of, of the authors means that the authors are getting involved in telling their stories. So the authors feel good about this and, and, and get to put more into it as well. So, so on both sides, whether it's from the authoring point of view or the user point of view or the publishing point of view, um, videoing is, is certainly adding, adding uh, a richness to things. Well, how does it achieve? What, what is it actually achieving? There's definitely, they've seen increased engagement. There's, there's more click-throughs. Um, and of course, there's that great thing of being able to sum up some research in a couple of minutes. And that real, that summing up is, is the thing that we really hope is widening that reach. It's a much, much easier way of, of digesting content. We all seem to be very busy uh, at the moment. Um, so that's, that's part of the point of this is, is to help us deal with that. Uh, a little side note there on accessibility. Uh, of course, there are accessibility issues with, with using audio and video. Um, RCGP particularly uh, are, are, so to, uh, are aware of those and have create, put in summary statements uh, uh, that are associated with, with the videos as well. So that was one example. Go on to the second example now. This is Springer Publishing, who have a site Connect. It's hosted by Highwire. Um, why are these guys using video? What's the point of it for them? Really, this is all about instruction. So, so the content on, on, on this site, a lot of it is explaining how to do things, uh, especially for nurses and doctors. So showing someone how to do something is such a great way of, of achieving this rather than uh, you know, a list of, of instructions. So let's just have a quick look at an example of that. So here is a book on physical examinations. Um, it's explaining how do you do physical examinations? And of course, it's got lots and lots of videos of clinicians doing those things. So I can click on here, show you what that looks like. Um, this first page we'll see, so evidence-based physical examination. This is the book as a whole, and we can scroll down and there's a whole load of chapters. Each one is how to do a certain type of thing. Um, just click on the first one of those and we'll see that the videos again are front and center 
Um, so here is the chapter and the, the videos are right at the front there. Um, I'll explain there's a bit difference here. So there's no YouTube in this. The, these videos are actually being held in Brightcove. So Brightcove is, for those of you who don't know, it's a dedicated video hosting system. Um, the videos get put into Brightcove in a similar way that, that they, the other RTGP ones were put into YouTube. And that means slightly different things on, on how the videos can be used and how the players work and so on. Um, come back to here. More examples for why Springer are using video. There's some things like EEGs and sonograms where providing the actual examples of, of how the device works and having a video that shows the readouts that those technologies produce is really, really important. And there you'll see that, that uh, how is it included? The videos are held at Brightcove and then they're embedded in the book content. And for those of you who care about the technology or technical stuff here, um, the way that works is uh, Springer give us a bit of XML and in XML it just says, in this place is a video and the Brightcove ID of that video is whatever. And then we use that to, to generate the page uh, like this and, and pull in the contents then from Brightcove. So challenges. Key challenges to come up for, for Springer was actually just how to provide access to this stuff in that some, some people within Springer were like, great, these videos are awesome. Let's get everyone just to see them for free because everyone should watch this stuff. It's really, really great content. Wouldn't that be great for you the experience? Everyone can see this stuff. And then of course that's against the kind of, uh, uh, we have to make some money somehow guys. Um, so there's this usability versus monetization uh, conflict going on. But kind of nice to see that the, the challenges here are on that sort of business level rather than anything kind of deeper. It's like, okay, great, we've got video. We know we want to use it. Let's make some choices over, over how, we, how we do use it to, to promote our business and promote our uh, users' um, experiences. So key things for, for video for Springer. As a user, absolutely, it's all about helping, helping that learning, learning process, as we've seen. Um, as a publisher, obviously, the more users who, who, who use stuff, the more likely that, that you'll be able to sell things. But also, there's a specific thing here, which is that for an instructor, if the textbook has got video on it, they found that the instructors are much more likely to take, take that textbook up. They can put the video straight onto their LMS. Um, and so it, it's, it's making a, a direct benefit to, to Springer's uh, business model. A few things here that Springer wants to do in the future, um, improve performance. So say they, they would like to create books with huge numbers of videos in. Um, so we want to do some things on the page like lazy, lazy loading so that, that can be done really easily without affecting the performance of the site. Um, we've moved on a long way from, from the kind of modem that, uh, uh, situation that Tony mentioned right at the beginning. Um, and now we, we've got large amounts of video and, and, and as Dylan mentioned as well, and we, we are gonna have more and more videos so performance is certainly a, an issue, but it's not, it's not something that we're scared about. It seems like everyone's just working out actually how's the best way of, of achieving these things with performance. Uh, Spring also mentioned there's a thing called Bright Curve Gallery that they're, that they're interested in looking into. And then the last one here, um, video search, uh, this, this site doesn't offer, you can't search across the video specifically. Um, I'll come on to the, on the next site and, and this will link in with what Margie was talking about, how, how we can achieve that in the future. Okay, so final example from me is from McGraw-Hill. Uh, two sites here, Access Engineering and Access Science. Access Engineering is very much a learning resource covering engineering content. Um, for, for people learning. Uh, Access Science is a more, has a more general audience of, of science content. So by video for these guys, uh, again, Access Engineering is absolutely for helping their students to solve problems. So uh, what they found is that, that hearing a professor talking about how to solve an engineering problem is, is much more useful than reading, reading about it in a textbook. So it helps, helps, helps the students to understand what's going on. Back to science is slightly different uh, point here. It's about bringing those scientific concepts to life, animations, demonstrations, explanations, all these things so that people can kind of get a sense of, of what the science is about. Again, here we, we talk about Brightcove. So the, the, the videos go into Brightcove and then they get embedded into the book content in exactly the way uh, that, that happens in Springer. But, and this is where we link up with, with Margie's talk, the videos are also separate entities in the UI and in the search. So in the interface, you'll see, I'll show you this in a sec, um, you'll see that the videos uh, exist in their own right. You can search them, you can see them in their own right, and then you can see where they are embedded within the books as well. So, so that's a really, really key difference there. Um, the transcripts are, are published through us as well with, alongside the videos, and those are indexed and tagged to the subject taxonomy, and that tagging is exactly what, what Margie was talking about a minute ago. 
So I'm just going to show you a, a little, little sense of, of how this works. I'll, I'll show you Access Science first. So on Access Science, what we have is, if I go to content, you'll see that there is videos as a separate uh, content item here, from the content type. I can click on there. So I immediately know there are videos on the site. Um, I can see uh, what those videos are. There's some highlights here. I could run a search. I can also see that those videos have been tagged against a taxonomy. This isn't the, 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 the Margie one at this point, um, uh, but this, this, these are tagged here. So if I wanted to go and find all the videos about say geophysics, I could come here, click on here, and I've got access to videos. So rather than them just being embedded within books, articles, and so on, videos are our first, right, first rate uh, item on this site. Let's now drop back and go to access engineering, show that one as well. So again, the UI here, the important thing I want to bring out is this video, the word videos is on the first screen. So I'm, I'm immediately, I can see there are videos on the site. I can click on here. This will run a search for all the videos that exist on the site um, and bring them out as, as first, first class citizens on the site. I can see those straight away. I could then come down to say this, uh, this one here, which I always seem to select because I think it's weird. There's a frog in a teacup. So here is the video. Um, again, this is from Brightcove. So, so similar controls to YouTube. Let's make a glass teacup with a frog in it. There are um, uh, all the captions and you can play at different speeds and all those things. I can also see the transcript underneath. There we go, sorry, I have that, access, that, that option. And then if I click on this button, view video in context, this is one of the most important bits here. I can come across from the video as, a, as its own separate item through to where that video is embedded within the context of a book chapter and then see you know, the, the, the extra information that I would get from seeing that within here. So then I can see, okay, I've got a project in here and I can see all the, all the text about that video. Um, I, I should go back, actually, one thing I just wanted to bring out as well about the, the video at this point here is on the right-hand side, these subjects here are exactly the things that have been tagged onto this video through the process that Margie was explaining. So, so this video has been tagged with these four things from the subject taxonomy through the techniques that Margie was, was describing. Okay, so that was just a quick example of, of how those things work in those two sites. And for McGraw Hill, the challenge is one of them is finding the right people to create the videos. So, so certainly the, the instructional videos, um, they need to find the people. There's also quite a lot of cost involved for, for these people. So we need to find subject matter experts and there's editing that needs to be done. And then the other thing is that for those engineering problems, actually they're really complicated things and the, the, the instructor could spend quite a long time explaining them, but people don't watch videos very long and they want short things. So, so there's a bit of a conflict there over kind of trying to deliver something at the, at the right, um, right length. Uh, benefits, it's very similar, better experience for users. And a key thing here, university students are thinking that the video first for learning, that is the message, absolutely. I wanna learn something, show me the video. Uh, future things they want to see, running their transcript under the video in real time, um, rather than just having it just displayed as a, as a static thing. And uh, a key thing that's been touched on a little bit throughout these talks, I think that facility to search within the transcript and jump to that point within the video. So you're looking through the transcript, finding something, um, and then you want to go to that point in the video. Uh, so this is a summary. There's various approaches available now, various technologies out there. Obviously, video is delivering improved user experience and therefore better reach and, and sales for publishers. And that future feels like it's really in that, that realm of discoverability and usability, especially in that thing of internal discoverability. That's, that's the real thing that we, we, we want to see next. And I just want to say thanks to, to Eric and Matt and Lauren and from those publishers for, for spending their time talking to me. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ollie. Um, and uh, thank you, Dylan and Bill and Margie. So uh, it, we are now opening it up to questions. I uh, have already have a few questions uh, from the audience, but I encourage you to, uh, to please go ahead and, and submit uh, any questions that you have um, so that we can uh, have uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, around the things that you're interested in. Um, and even if you just have a statement, we're happy to hear that and maybe react to it. So 
uh, please go ahead and do that. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, a couple of questions, Dylan, for you. Uh, they, those came in early. Um, and so uh, one of the questions, uh, has there been any effort to review or assess content of conference video recordings? Is there an opportunity to create a venue uh, for such reviews uh, comparable to CHOICE, which is all in caps, which I, I'm not sure what that is, but maybe somebody here does, uh, for scholarly books and websites? Um, uh, no, not as yet. Um, I think that is something that would potentially have some value as more of this content um, becomes available. Choice is essentially like a book reviewing um, periodical, um, probably digital now. Um, and I don't know of any anything like that that exists at the moment, no. Is, is Choice something that librarians use uh, yes. as a resource? Okay. Yeah. So when they talk about review, they're really not talking about peer review. They're talking about sort of uh, a, a way to help. I, I assume. I mean, I'm interpolating their question, but I I, I think what's being asked here is about um, guides to help end users understand what's out there and available. Okay. There were though um, in the olden days um, places that existed and they still exist to review educational media content. Um, so that material was reviewed by, by boards um, and then um, shared pretty widely by people who would be interested in buying those videos um, to add to their collection in the school district. So there's a prototype, but I don't think it's really there for um, college. Most of those were K through 12 materials, not college level and beyond. So uh, Dylan, there's another question. Uh, you said that libraries think of the recorded conference presentations as uh, more in the instructional area, not research oriented, uh, which is a disconnect between how faculty think about conferences. Are libraries reluctant to purchase instructional video or just unclear about conference video value? Yeah, I mean, my hunch is that it's more the latter. Um, and I think actually, um, Ollie, it was really interesting to see how much instruction jumped out as a really driving the decisions that the publishers that you spoke with um, are making about how to use video. Um, I think that libraries are are spending a significant amount of money right now on streaming video uh, licenses with Canopy, uh, Alexander Street Press, it's Jove, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and our survey earlier this year found that they expect that the proportion of their budget that they're spending on streaming content uh, is likely to double over the next five years or so. Um, so it is becoming an important part of libraries acquisition strategies. I think the, the point that I was trying to make um, was more that as library, when asked if they were interested in purchasing conference content, uh, librarians showed very little interest in it. Um, my sense is that's because they perceive this as mostly of value to researchers, and that's not really why they're buying video. So I think if that kind of content is going to become something that libraries acquire and, and at scale, um, one of the things that needs to happen is to make the argument for the value of this as a research-focused product, um, because frankly, a, a lot of the conference content uh, is not super likely to be useful for undergraduate education. It's really aimed at scholars. Um, and so I think we have people have not yet made the case for the value of these kind of outputs in a way that's compelling to libraries. And Tony, I've got a got a comment if I could add a, sure. add a few words. Yeah, of course. Um, I think there's a uh, a factor here that that may be uh, discipline specific. So, for example, um, it was years ago I was. Uh, doing consultancy with uh, IEEE and discovered that for many of their societies or certain of their societies, 
what the um, what their members depend on for tenure track advancement isn't journal publication, it's conference presentations. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking in, in, in some of those disciplines, there's probably a lot more pressure for those conference presentations to be out there uh, because that's how those folks are judged more than, uh, more than print publication. It, it, um, it's interesting, the uh, a related point, um, Dylan, you had said, uh, you know, conferences, uh, the fact in a faculty survey, conferences were the, the single most important resource for for uh, the respondents and um, which, of course, indicates that this uh, what we used to call enduring materials, maybe they still call it that um, are really useful. Um, do you know if there was um, if there were any follow up to that, like was was all networking? uh an important part of the of the conference also or you know, uh, can we extrapolate anything from that um yeah so um the way this question came up so every year since 2000 snr has been doing this national survey of faculty um and the instrument is primarily designed to allow for uh, measuring longitudinal change over time. Um, so it's a relatively static instrument. The specific question that this data point comes from is a question that asks instructors to um, indicate how they keep up with research in their field. And so um, conference presentations is one of the options, uh, you know, uh, skimming the titles of Journals is another example of what is on that list of seven or eight choices that people have. Um, so no, we don't have good follow-up, but the question is phrased specifically to be about the presentations, not about the kind of uh, spontaneous interactions that happen at conferences, which presumably are also really valuable, but maybe in a slightly different way, yeah. or maybe not, but they're not um, what that question is really getting at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I hope I'm not eating up Q&A time, but that, that, that a related question seems to me is citation. Uh, is, is there a good way to cite these videos of conferences? Uh, do they have DOIs? Well, there's, you know, either is a DOI of video, but it's a entertainment industry DOI. And what about a cross-ref DOI for videos? It seems to me maybe it's early days for this, but I could see that happening. Yeah, the, the next step for the um, for the uh, NISO uh, working group that should uh, eventually become a standing committee. So there you go. <laughs> Margie, did you yeah. yeah, so a few years ago, there was an innovation research um, actually done in cooperation with the patent office, the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and they found just the path of research and innovation was that people would work on a patent and until they had it submitted as a um, uh, provisional patent, they kind of kept quiet about everything that this new stuff was going to be. But once it was a provisional patent application, then they could talk about it in conferences and other venues. And when after conferences, they tended to um, write journal articles. And then once the uh, object was well established, they might move on to a book. But in terms of the progression of when are you going to learn about new stuff, where are you going to find out about what's the happening business in your field, it's getting to those conference papers um, pretty early to find out where the new breaking developments are. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. One of going back to when I was talking about um, back in the 1990s when I was with Silver Platter Education, um, we found that actually that putting conferences on CD-ROM was was really a fantastic uh, product that people wanted more than our interactive multimedia stuff. Um, it was a lot different uh, process in that we you know we digitized the voice and then we digit we had to 
pry the carousel out of the hands of the researcher and digitize their slides uh, and then put that all together. Um, uh, and the only thing we used the video for was to mark, map, mark the uh, transcript to where the slide changes. But, uh, you know, it was that it's content that's been, you know, that's in high, was in high demand then. And, and I think that, you know, we've actually made it so much easier to, uh, to capture it. Um, so that's great. A couple of other questions here. Um, there was a question about uh, what mechanisms mechanisms are in place for sharing when video is embedded uh, in articles and books. Uh, for example, an interlibrary loan, uh, any guidance for application of fair use? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Doesn't I sound... Okay, oh, yeah. I can tell you that in old days when we were producing those videos for NYSEM, they were very expensive pieces. I mean, several hundred dollars each, which at that time was a lot of money for each school district. So it was very, very active interlibrary loan. I am guessing that publishers are going to say that the videos that they have put into their textbooks um, would they would frown upon the fair use options, but that's just me. I think it's a new battleground appearing. Yeah. Well, I, I guess if there's any anybody in the audience that has a comment on that, uh, we'd be interested in to hear that. Um, great. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, another question here. Do any of do any of the panel have a view on where production values for this kind of content are going to head? Do we envisage slick studio productions or continued focus on talking head slides, technique demonstrations, animations? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I do have an, my, my own observation about how we have um, that YouTube and uh, looking to see how we change our the tire on our bike or how we uh, use our wet vac for wet um, rather than dry vacuuming, which are the two most recent reasons I you went to YouTube. I don't really care so much about the quality of that video. It's mostly about how quickly they get to the point. <laughs> so, but I'll open that up for the panel. Well, Anybody? I'm guessing for books, it's going to, and journals, it's going to be slick because there are publishing values within those organizations that um, people aren't going to want to compromise on, but for how-tos and conference materials, it's going to be um, aim the camera and let her run. And I think from the perspective of those 40 plus use cases that we uh, looked at in our project, uh, the answer, I think, is all of the above. Um, you know, it, it depends on who's producing it, what's the purpose of it, how is it distributed, et cetera. So some warrant slick production values, others, uh, it's it's the level of TikTok, right? N anything in between. I don't think it's gonna gravitate to one particular uh, solution. I think one of the things that's, that's fascinating to me is, is just that scale thing. And that there will be, you know, the slick ones, but there's going to be so much of the unslick ones and, and that the chain, obviously we've been talking about discoverability. Um, it reminds me of the thing that, that, that you know, we have often people saying, well, can you record this Zoom? Can you record this Zoom? No one ever watches those recordings, I think, or very, very few, but we have piles and piles of recordings. They was like, maybe there's something interesting in here. Probably not. But, but there will be, you know, there, there are going to be little gems. So it's really fascinating how, how we, you know, improve our discoverability and also stop making recordings of everything because it's too much, isn't it? Or do we, or should we just record everything and then look, wait for later generations to work out how, you know, to sift through it or to, to find those gems? It's interesting. You know, one subset of this is the conference proceedings, but it seems to be one that uh, we're talking a lot about because it's a, it's such an obvious use case. Um, and I thought I would point out because of my earlier comment about do we, do we have a DOI for these videos? Well, we do have a DOI for the con for the conference proceedings, right? So um, 
there, there's potential to to create some kind of discovery linkage there. I mean, a, a lot of the startups are integrating DOIs into um, the services that they offer. I think. I think always right though that it's not just about like can you find that the presentation exists somewhere on the internet, but it's it's very likely the way people consume media that they're interested in you know what Margie has to say, but not what Dylan has to say, or that if you're thinking about this in a like a conference uh, situation, uh, you know my background's in history and I might be very interested in a certain part of a twenty minute talk. But not, but be turned off immediately if I get hit with ten minutes of historiography that I already know that I don't need to deal with. Um, and so there are questions about like how do you direct readers to the parts of it that are going to matter to them. Um, and I think, I, you know, I think this is really complicated also because there are questions about what it might mean to orient scholarly communication into a visual media and how um, the norms of scholarly communication might change once that happens, whether in conference proceedings or in summaries of articles or what have you. Um, the emphasis that video places on like short, quick, uh, ideally some eye candy are very different than the conventional norms of scholarly communication. Um, and without trying to like, you know, just play one off the other, there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake in this question about like, where does the line between something that's interesting to watch versus something that's communicating information, you know, how does that work and what are the implications of that for what ultimately all this is about is communicating uh, research knowledge. You know, and since we're definitely talking about a scholarly focus here, one of the pressures on scholarly research is to make everything open, right? So we talk about making the article open and making the research data open and making the software open. Well, guess what? There's, you know, particularly for in medicine, for example, videos of say a surgical procedure or experimental results, et cetera, can be re really valuable. So in a sense that that becomes part of the, of the scholarly record of that research. Mm -hmm. Right. I think so, we can learn a lot, though, from our friends in entertainment who are, uh, you know, the, the TV and so on stations that are sending out huge amounts of data. And they are classifying it by genre and by information levels that um, we don't normally look at or subscribe to. But uh, uh, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, for example, have a great deal of work going on in that area. Well, that will have to be the last word because we are at the end of our 90 minutes. Um, uh, interesting what you brought up at the end there, Dylan. Um, I was actually planning to identify the time, to the time markers where each person spoke so that if anybody coming back to watch will know which ones they might want to, what they might've missed or which ones they might want to see twice. Um, and, uh, so that was, I, I was thinking that that would have been, that would be useful. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Bill, I was going to ask you if you had blurred out the Rosetta Stone for GDPR purposes, but I guess I didn't get to ask you that. Um, and what I really want to do is just thank you all so much. Um, I wish we had longer for the discussion that was uh, getting good. And uh, um, uh, I will, uh, we will be putting this out um, on YouTube. Um, and thank you again, all of the attendees for joining us and uh, goodbye. Okay, bye-bye. Oh.